Biersch. I'm joined once again by Randolph Childress, Terrence Oglesby, and my guy, Sean Farnham. What's up? It's Final early. Four. Yes, of up course. Early. I already got my workout in today. <laughs> Come on, let's not worry about anything. I saw you, you know, you were Pumps Party, Inner I was not at Pumps Party. You were bouncing around. You, know you were everywhere. First of all, I did the, the college sl- I did the college slam dunk three point competition last night. And if, if you watch that show, it was like three hours. Was so it that's like, that's was it where like I the was. Pumps Party? I don't know. I wasn't at the Pumps Party. Well, you've been at the Pumps Party before. Yes, probably. Uh, yeah, I would say probably similar. Look, look. Last night, I, th- I would say this: the dunk competition. They, they uh, Intersport uh, announced five thousand dollars for the winner uh. of each event. Amazing competition, amazing competition. The dunk competition last night, the college level outshined the NBA easily. Oh yeah, I well, mean it was it was, was, it the was NBA wasn't. I mean, you might have been able to outshine the NBA this year. Hard, I can still dunk. Hard, so I can. hard finger rolls would have won the NBA. Yeah, Jordan Bohannon was great last night. Uh, great to see him. I mean, look. I mean, he started playing college basketball in 2002. Uh, so it, it was good Sorry, to see him still, finally. He's still a year short. I, I still say Robbie Hummel's got everybody beat. No, longest tenured player. Okay, who had the over under on a Hummel mention that that early right in the away. show? Oh, <laughs> here we go. Little okay, son for go. good men. Okay, uh, okay, I don't know okay. if you know this. Did you see the article? In the, you see the article in the. Atlantic on Hummel, he's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hey, easy, Goodman, easy. Listen, I, I've known Farnham since he was begging me to come on his show at Fox Sports Radio years and years ago. It's right? true. Remember when we it's had that true. power dinner? Yes, power dinner. Paulus was yep. there. Yep. Uh, it was at back in Indianapolis. That was actually right before I, I came to ESPN. And obviously, the last 13 years now at ESPN have been great. Uh, just kind of continuing to grow uh, professionally. And, uh, you know, the opportunity to love this sport. Like, I love this sport. You guys all love this sport. Like, yeah. so anytime we have a chance to uh, embrace the sport as where it's at and see where it's transitioning to, uh, I think we're in, a, we're in a big part of that right now. We have, a, we have legend, you know, we're going to lose a legend this weekend, whether it's 40 minutes or 80 minutes uh, in Coach K. We lost Roy Williams, Long Kruger last year, iconic coaches that have had so much success. You Staring down the pipeline at Bayheim, yeah. Leonard Hamilton, Larinaga. I mean, you can go down a list of great coaches that have meant so much to our sport. Uh, and I was just talking to Coach Valentine from Loyola Chicago, and I think he's a star. I think Kim English is a star. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and my hope is that as we, media broadcasters, and what you guys are doing, we need to shine light on the next grouping. And, yep. and yeah, there's, there's Chris Beard, and there's Mark Few, and there's Scott Drew, and those guys, they're already established, Jay Wright. Um, but we need, to, we need to elevate that next grouping, too, and we need to start bringing more light to them uh, because I think the game looks different, feels different. It's evolving so quickly before our eyes that we need to find a way uh, to, to promote it to allow fans to understand that while we lose some of these great iconic coaches, that we've got so many great coaches that are coming up that have paid their dues, that have worked so hard uh, to get the opportunity that they so have. Who's that next in. guy? Give me a couple names. Well, I think Kim, I think Kim English is a star. I think Kim English will be. It's too early to put okay, Kim I think English fine. I, mean, I think Todd on, Golden's like, going to be great at Florida. You guys got him coming on a little bit later on. Yeah. I spent time with him, and you can you can ask him the story. Like the WCC tournament uh, two years ago was the first time I, I saw him coach, and I was doing sideline because Dickie B was doing the game. It was Gonzaga versus San Francisco, and I and sure I went you over got in a lot of, lot of I, words in that it, broadcast, and, and I jumped in I jumped in the 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 huddle. And I listened to Todd Golden, the message, and how he was delivering his message to his team. Mm. And I, and I, I told him after right? that game, I said, listen, man, I don't know where or how it's going to turn out, but I can promise you this. You are going to be at a high major sooner rather than later, and you are going to be a star. I think he's going to win a national championship or at least wow. be in a Final Four oh, within the next Sean, six that's years. Bold, isn't oh, it? That's a bold, that's wow. a bold statement. Ooh. Really bold statement. I, I, like, I, I just, he's very, look, the analytics aspect of the game and understanding it, understanding scheduling, like how hard they play defensively. Like he had a great defensive team this year at San Francisco, mm-hmm. and he did it with guys that, that wouldn't even register on the radar of the SEC. And true. so he's going to go to the SEC. He's going to have that engine of Florida behind him. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's going to be awesome. He's right behind you. Who, who do you guys think? Who, who's kind of that next guy? I think, Is there a next guy? You could throw a couple of names out there. I think a guy that I'm intrigued to see how he does with the move to the SEC is Dennis Gates. I oh, yeah. Say Dennis. I think yeah. Dennis is unbelievable. He's part of that Leonard Hamilton tree. And that's a big part of it. Yeah. Mizzou, li- likely a football school when all is said and done. I mean, SEC, football, he- heaven, basically. You move him over there. He's had that experience at a football school while he's at Florida State. I think he's a guy to keep an eye on. My, my thought about it is it's got to be the fit, though. Yeah, I think some of these guys that we think they check all those boxes, but it's got to be that's my word. The, about the minus, I, listen, the, 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 the small I, I, thing I, I, is it's got to be a fit. It's like Shocker now. When we saw Shocker yeah. this morning, we talked to him. 
Marquette fits him. Oh, yeah. Yes. And Way better than Texas And he's going to oh. be right there. So we think of him as he's in that batch of next great coaches. Yeah. But you wouldn't say that at Texas. But we feel that way in Marquette in just one year. So I think the fit has to match the talent. We need to keep having this conversation, though. And yes. we need to keep thinking yes. about names. Yep. And we need to keep talking about these names. Listen, I say this all the time. Leonard Hamilton doesn't get nearly oh. enough respect for no, what he has meant to the game, how well he's coached the game. For a long time. And, and, and his, look, one of the things that impresses me most, he gets lottery picks that never start. That's right. That's like, right. we talk about the impressive nature of, like, one-and-done era and how guys have been able to navigate and work through this. He can, goes in and convinces one-and-done talent you can come to me, you're never going to start, and don't worry about it, you're still going to be a lottery pick, and yeah. I'm going to make you better, and you're going to love me for it. And these guys love him. Yeah. And, I, I mean, I think Leonard Hamilton, as the ACC transitions here without Coach K, we need to start telling – I mean, it's, it's late in the ball game, and we should have been doing it for years. We need to start telling more stories about Leonard Hamilton. But the, pr the problem is, again, what do people want to hear? They want to hear about that yeah, school, and that school. school, and that school, and that school, and now this school yeah. has moved. I'm sorry. Right? Wait. RC can't there we go. too close. There can't we go. do it. He's got to. He's got to flip him. I get it. Okay. But, but like, okay. So Villanova has been able to get there to where now we're talking about them, maybe not at the same level, blue blood wise, as Kansas or Carolina or Duke, but they've certainly put themselves in the equation now. Well, right? Jay, Jay Wright's been unbelievable. But I mean, do you have on. to win like titles. No. No, I mean, I got in this conversation. So people talk about this all the time because I do so many WCC games. Well, Gonzaga's not elite because they haven't won a national championship. Stupid. Get out of here. Right. Yeah. What What are you watching that you don't think that they're elite? What marker do they hit? They, do they miss except for not winning the national championship? That's the only marker left for Mark Few. Yeah. Everything else, you know, first-round draft picks, got it. Lottery picks, got it. Number one prospect in the country, got it. Wins more games than everybody else, got it. Beats Power 5 conference teams every single non-conference, got it. More tournament wins than any team in the tournament field in the last you know, 10 years, got it. Mm -hmm. like, what do you want from him? Okay, you want that one game. Mark right. wants that one game. If you, ask, I just talked to Mark yesterday walking down the street out here. He, he's sick they, to his they stomach. They got to, to, to the Final Four? Yes. <laughs> I'm I saw, shocked. That's I mean, a, Listen, he's, I mean, he, he, was, right he was not happy. You know, Never, like, no, he doesn't want to come to these things. He doesn't want to go recruiting. So, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a testament to the consistency in which he's coached at that that's now the standard for him. Right, right. right. And sometimes you've it, underachieved. It's like, come on. And really? sometimes what you're a you victim doing? of your own success. Yeah. And I think that's a little bit when, and when we look at Mark Few. But I think when you look at Jay Wright, like, there, Jay Wright has nothing to prove to anybody. He's as elite as a coach as it comes. Now, I just wish he'd bring the suit game back. Because the suit game was great. Hey, my wife, he's my wife's game. favorite coach yeah. in the country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my mom loves some Jay Wright. But I had this conversation the other day. They say, well, is Villanova Blue Blood? I think Blue Bloods want to be Villanova at this point. What have they been to? What is a Blue Blood? Four? Yeah, exactly. Can we wait? No, because I, I, we got in this conversation uh, before. You talk about Blue Bloods. Okay, so okay, so traditional Blue Bloods. Okay, since so we know that three of these hats definitely are traditional Blue Bloods. UCLA would be a traditional yep. Blue Blood. Yep. You know, you talk about Indiana. Indiana's a traditional Blue Blood, even though they're not blue. Traditional. You know, right. but like, but we have to identify what ago. is, like, you know, Leonard Hamilton, New Bloods, mm. right? Like, and we talk about, like, this idea of, all right, where is Arizona? Well, they've won a national championship, so they're established. Well, they haven't won a national championship in the lifetime of anybody that is actually playing college basketball right now. I hear the UCLA you know, coming out. UCLA hasn't won a national championship since 1995. Yep. Indiana. You know, Indiana. Indiana. Like, yeah. so, so now we have to look at where we're at in college basketball. You could say UConn to a lot of these kids is a power, even though it went through a little bit of a dip because of the number of national championships and big stage. And Danny, obviously, now back in the Big East, has put themselves in a position where I think that program is going to continue to emerge and continue to grow. Um, so I, I think it's, it, it's untraditional, and we have to stop looking in the tradition. College yep. basketball's tradition is important. Tradition is important in fanship. Mm -hmm. But it is, from a media perspective, I think that we need to do a better job of telling the story of where we're at now and where this game is going and, and growing within that. So many people hang on to whatever their greatest moment is, no matter how far back it is. Like and Goodman saying that, that dinner with me. It was the greatest the moment of his life. To, to today <laughs> and had achieved it in like 30 years or 40 yeah. years or whatever, but that's the standard of the thinking that. And again, it, it, it's, it's plausible now to think that way with the transfer portal. By the way, did, did Rob tee you up? On the, on the UConn oh, no. thing? No. Did he play? Okay. Yeah. No. But, I, I mean, I just think, again, <laughs> but that was a, a, a move that was made out of conference, right. and you're trying to excite UConn fans about playing, you know, Tulsa or Tulane. Those aren't traditional yeah, rivalries, right. and those that's people right. in the Northeast aren't going to react to it. Now that you've reestablished those, those games against Seton Hall and Villanova, all of a sudden now the, the, their, their fan base is more energized. If you were in the XL Center uh, for that game against Providence – 
like that place was unbelievable falling out loud and like that's what you want in college basketball you want those type of games those type of scenes and when we have those scenes it's not only good for the players it's not only good for the coaches not only good for the programs it's good for the audience it, it, there's a reason why the, the people watching college basketball went up this year versus last year and the games are good the, the talent was good but people were there so when you're flipping around you just didn't hear sneakers squeaking on the floor during covid you saw people back in the stands and the better the environment the more exciting it was uh, people wanted to pay attention and, and Listen, watch. Here, I mean, you look at today, we wake up, and, and really Thursday's a day of coaches coming mm -hmm. in, right? That's what yeah. Thursday is. Friday's a day of coaches, and then fans come in, and you get the atmosphere. And You know, we're looking out here right outside Gordon Beers, and the Hilton's across the street. We're right next to the casino, which is not a good thing. Um, <laughs> for you. <laughs> yeah, for probably a lot of people, not just me. <laughs> but, but you walk down a Bourbon Street, and today you're going to have that atmosphere. Darius Rucker's performing in town tonight. Ooh, nice. Darius that Rucker got a little wagon wheel. I'm going to try to see that. Well, I'm gonna what, we, what we learned from all this thing is college basketball is so much more than the game. It's the pageantry of the yeah. game, right? So I think that's the biggest thing. Well, another, another name we didn't have talked about, Shaheen Holloway, just got seen. Oh, yeah. That's I mean, what he name. did that's, at St. Peter's this yeah, year. Like, yeah. by the way, that was the biggest layup hire in the history of mankind. I mean, yeah, you didn't need to search for him to figure that one out. Listen, you screwed that up. It took a while. That hire, it took a little while. Like, they didn't. They should have paid him even more. I'll, that's all I'll say to that. They Look, should have paid him even more. I think the game of college basketball is in great hands. I think the the co younger coaches that are coming up are, are it's a younger energetic. It's game. And, and we talk about our fan base is getting older. Our fan base is getting older because our coaches have been getting older. And yep. so often we promote coaches and we don't talk about the players as much. We, we highlight games. And Tom Izzo and the Michigan State right. Wolverine, right. I mean Michigan State right. Spartans are taking on Jawan Howard and the Michigan Wolverines. No, they're like, not. Right. Like, they're not playing. No, they're not right. playing. Right. And so, so we, have to, we have to put more attention on the players. And it's, it's harder because of the transfer portal. Um, but that's our responsibility in the media, I feel, to make the stars. We have the capabilities to make the stars. We have the capabilities to highlight the talent that we have in so, various platforms. So why platforms. has this program been able, Villanova, to not go the transfer route and be so successful? Because why? you don't have to. I mean, look, Chris Beard yeah. went the transfer route all day long, and it didn't work this year, like to the level in which people expect it. I think there's no one way – to, to, to do skin it, it. Uh, you know you, there's different ways you have to be comfortable and know who you are and how you want to go do it and I think that I've talked to a lot of coaches too at some of the lower levels like talking about the WCC because so many of these schools are going for the transfer portal what it does is it opens up some guys that were maybe low-level Pac-12 kids to be available now for middle Mid of the road schools. WCC so I think you have to find a balance yeah, because yeah, close it. so what makes Villanova great we all know it's the culture of the sure. program. Like right. everybody talks about, they, they could have the best culture in college basketball. So you can't do the transfer portal and maintain culture on a consistent basis because you have different parts, different components, different verbiage being used, and you're drink, bringing players in, and you're trying to acclimate them and assimilate as fast as you possibly can. I think what you do is you, you, uh, you can take a guy because one guy – Caleb with, with with a locker room yeah. full of guys yeah. that already know exactly what you want to do, they now understand and they are able to execute in that way, and they he assimilates to the team. Sure. But if you bring in four guys, five guys, yeah. now all of a sudden the team is going to be fighting against those guys onto what that culture, what that identity of the program is. It changes year by year when you do that. Yeah. yeah. You know, you can't say you're going to have a culture and you're bringing in five guys because – T.O. graduates and goes out the door. I'm coming in. I got no idea what it was like playing with T.O. what he yep. did here. I'm coming in here trying to figure that out. There's a lot to be said. We had Brad Underwood on here yesterday, and he talked about having Trent Frazier as that guy. Yep. Right? As long as you have one of your culture, but I guess culture pieces, but one guy that kind of knows how things are run, it obviously expedites things. It has to be the voice, right? That's right. Like, that's right. You, you can't have the, the guy that's 13th man on your bench be the culture guy because yep. it's a lot harder to get that message permeated through the rest of the locker room at that Absolutely. time. People always say that, and I always say, if you don't have a players-led locker room, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Coaches can say that every coach is competent and they know what they want to say. If it's not led by your players, all these programs here have players in their locker room leading their program and extension of the coach. Like you said now, sometimes the coaches is so much about them, and if it doesn't translate out, if you're not a player-led program, you're not, you, won't, you will never have the chance to be in a situation like this. All right, I'm going to pivot a little bit because I have to ask you this before we lose you. And you know, we talked about it off air, but I was reading an article the other day. Your son is big into the esports game, <laughs> and World of Warcraft, the finals or championships or something like that. And you're a forward-thinking per person, and I wanted to relate this to basketball. But 
eight times more people, more viewers than the Super Bowl for some of yeah. these championship games. It's insane. Your son's into it big time. How, how do you think that college basketball, you talk about moving forward and things like that. How could we incorporate that? I think the college basketball video game coming in could be part of that, right? Could be part of that. I think, look, video games, eSports continues to grow. I went to the call. My son's a big uh, Call of Duty guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you can follow him on my Twitter account. You can how see all you? of his videos. Are you any good? I'm horrible. Um, <laughs> but he's great, and he's part of Rising NorCal, which is an eSports team. Yeah. And uh, he's got followers on his YouTube channel and all that stuff. So I, I didn't really understand it, right? Like, I'm a basketball guy. I don't understand any yeah, of that. I'm with you. And so he said, you know, like, but as a father, you, you, you learn to respect what your kid's passion is. And so I was like, all right. So he's like, Dad, you want to go with me to the Call of Duty League Championships? And so I went, and there's a, the Atlanta FaZe, which is part of the FaZe Clan, which is, is a huge multi-million dollar entity now. Yeah. I mean, they're living in a $30 million house in L.A. right now. Um, those guys are unbelievable. But the money that's being funded into that, like, we have to understand why, where's the connection point there? Like, and I didn't understand it until I went. And then when I went, I was like, oh, I get this. Like, this is an actual sport for you guys. Yeah. Like, this is, this is how your generation is seeing sport. And so then the, the question becomes, how can we make them see basketball uh, as same. a sport? And how can we appeal to that audience? And I think we need to be more innovative. I think we need to think outside of the box and not just cover basketball as its entity. But, like, understand, like, there's, there's college student athletes. Like, I talked to Drew Timmy. Drew Timmy wants to play with my son mm. because he's a big Call of Duty guy. And I'm like, dude, I, like, I, want, I want to listen to that conversation between you and Timmy <laughs> uh, doing that. But – these kids, that's what they're talking about when they're out. So we need to talk a little bit more about that. We need to figure out a way, can we tie in their platforms and what they're doing, social media, NIL, in Instagram followers. What is it that they're hitting on that's bringing them attention? And then can we, can we incorporate any of that in our broadcast? You know? And as the game comes, we need to change some rules. I think we need to, we need to update the rule book, things that work, and why, why we have to be different. Let's have some quarters. Why can't we have quarters and reset fouls? Yep. Is it hard? Like, everybody else in the world is doing it except for college amazing. basketball. Amazing. Like, but, whoa. we, we got to get rid of we, that extra TV right. time. By the way, right. we, we right. can't advance. We can't advance the ball because we'd miss the Leitner shot. Uh, well, first of all, if you didn't have any timeouts, we'd still have the Leitner shot. But second of all, if we're talking about the Leitner shot that was 30 years ago, maybe we missed some other moments in the last 30 years that would have been good yeah, for the good game point. of college basketball. Nobody's so. better about transitions than, than Sean Farr, without even knowing it. He, he does great transitions because the guy back there talking about the Leitner shot. Oh, my gosh. Ladies and gentlemen. That? By the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to out him right here. Come on, coach. Come up here. Okay. So we talk about this business.